Uh, so we're, we're very lucky to be joined by Maria Strack and uh, Francisca Tannerberger, who will introduce themselves um, around about uh, on the hour. Uh, we may start that segment uh, a little earlier if we possibly can, because um, there are various people who need to leave on the hour. But um, uh, the goal is to make this as, uh, as participatory as possible, as engaging as possible, to get you to think uh, about your own networks and what you can do to achieve more impact. Uh, we'll be very practical, but we'll also think very deeply about this in the first session. There's going to be a number of breakout room sessions as part of this to get you to interrogate each other and help each other as part of what we do today. Um, and then in this, uh, the final segment, the, the last half hour uh, or more, we'll see how the time goes, uh, then uh, Maria and Francisca are going to share some of their experience. Uh, and uh, and uh, we'll have an extended uh, session for questions and answers. Both Maria and Francisca are Peatland researchers. Um, this is a session that is run by the UNEP Global Peatlands Initiative uh, with uh, each of the uh, other uh, organizers, uh, Yessi in particular. Uh, Jane is, uh, is helping to organize things for us today. Thank you, Jane. Um, uh, and we have uh, members of the people in DCR action team with us here today uh, and perhaps see Pete as well uh, but uh, we have people from across the board uh, you do not have to be doing peatland research to be able to get something out of today's session uh, but those are the the kinds of examples we're going to be working with specifically in that final session so I'm going to start with an icebreaker exercise and if we can we're going to do this in pairs we'll see if this works um, you have here a, a shot of what it looks like on uh, on my desk at the moment, um, and uh, I'm going to invite you to pick something up from your desk and briefly share a story about that object that tells us something about you. So uh, it's going to be, uh, let me see, if we can do it in pairs, that will give you four minutes, so that's going to be two minutes per person. Um, and you'll get a one minute countdown to rejoin the room. That's how this is going to work. Uh, and uh, for those of you who've just joined, let me just leave this back on the screen. This is your task in the icebreaker, in the, uh, in the room. Introduce yourself to your neighbor. Great, okay, we are joined back by everyone, fantastic. So great to see you all, um, and uh, feel free to leave your camera on if you wish, or turn it off, entirely up to you. Uh, and uh, hopefully you've learned something about each other. Uh, I'm going to, uh, to use what we've just learned in that breakout room in a moment, uh, and I'm going to share my, uh, an example in answer to this question. Uh, but our first uh, starting point is to oops, start um, there we go, <laughs> either uh, practically uh, or deeply in terms of what are the skills or what is the expertise that you need to network effectively? And I'd like everyone to, uh, to put something down. It can be a principle, uh, as I'm going to share. It can be something very practical. Uh, here is my, my one-liner opener to, to someone new uh, that I meet at a conference. Uh, here's what I do on social media, or whatever it might be uh, in whatever kind of uh, online or face-to-face -face situation. And uh, I'm going to give you two principles that for me lock together and that we're going to come back to throughout the session. And those two principles are curiosity and empathy. Uh, this is about being endlessly curious about provoking your sense of curiosity now, even if I am talking to someone who shares what they do and my instant reaction is wow I don't even understand what that is or I am instantly bored uh, I am challenging myself to find something that I could find interesting about this something that I could uh, delve into that would create that spark and for me, the next step, once I've become curious, is to find that spark of empathic connection. Okay, now this is something that I resonate with. This is something that connects to me as a person, whether that's to my values, whether that's to my interests, to my research. Uh, and at that point, I go, go from curiosity, from, from curiosity to empathic connection. Now, 
to connecting ideas and potentially now to connecting this person to other people, other networks, uh, with people who might be able to share ideas, exchange knowledge. Uh, but for me, to remember, if I, if I remember nothing else, it's about that challenge of pairing curiosity with empathy. Um, uh, and of course, some very practical ways in which we can go about that. And lots of great ideas already. Uh, so people piling in in terms of the principles here. Uh, I love this. Uh, Bobby, thank you. Compassion. Uh, uh, who is this? Um, I forgot the name of the uh, the person now who who talks about this. Um, but compassion, it can be defined as empathy that takes action, uh, which is exactly my point. Um, I get curious enough to find a point of connection. And now I'm asking, how could I use this for good? How could I turn this into action? Where does this go next? Uh, Caroline, opening your minds. Great. Louisa, listening and asking up for asking follow up questions. Um, uh, lots of people talking about listening. Diane, moving on to active listening. Um, uh, and I wonder if you can expand on that. I, I just recently read a book uh, about active listening that said, yeah, you know what you are taught is about eye contact and nods and uh, and ums and ahs and showing that you listen, uh, but actually you can fake that. Ultimately, active listening is about empathic connection, and you know when someone is connecting to what you are saying. Uh, there's a there's something on some deeper level than than anyone can ever fake. <laughs> so do feel free to to do, to go deeper than that uh, if you want. Uh, but great um, uh, probing, transparency, respect. Yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, Bobby, following on, I learned that uh, a Samye Ling, uh, oh, I, I learned that at, at a retreat. Uh, it was a Dalai, Dalai Lama who said it. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, Flavi, always thinking, how can this connect or help, uh, connect to or help other people? And I think having that attitude of always asking what could come from this, how could it help, instantly is an attitude of uh, of impact and so uh, i think uh, that's a, it's a great diving off point for where i want to go with this uh, next uh, we want to network yes but we are networking with a purpose not just to uh, to, to satisfy idle uh, curiosity uh, not just to create lasting relationships through empathic connection but there is this idea of uh, empathy that takes action uh, asking how I might now be able to help this person or use what I'm learning to help others. Is there some action that we could take? So we started very practical and uh, thinking about what you guys perhaps perhaps do. Um, uh, and uh, and so um, uh, this is uh, this is my point I already made. Uh, uh, what we're doing when we take this empathic approach, uh, which is uh, about going in before we then go out to network more broadly and see if there is uh, an impact. Uh, we are recognizing that when we are networking professionally, we are taking our whole selves into these conversations. And I think that uh, professional networking can often be very strategic uh, and perhaps quite mercenary, uh, perhaps even Machiavellian. A sense that I'm here to get what I can in terms of networks that could bring me funding or uh, or impact or my next project or whatever else it might be. And I think that that, that people ultimately see through that. And there's something quite cold and hard uh, and that, that, that doesn't invite others. And so I wonder, can we get more practical now? As we imagine ourselves on social media, in online spaces, uh, in, in meetings uh, and seminars and webinars like, the, the, like this today, and in face-to-face -face settings, uh, how do we bring that whole authentic self, uh, someone used the word transparency earlier on, uh, into these? Uh, and what techniques, what practices, what habits, what other practical things can we do that can enable us to create that empathic connection as the foundation then for reaching out and connecting ideas and people that can achieve impact? So you can write again in the chat or you can share what you do, your techniques, by raising a hand instead. But let's 
remain uh, sharing at this point, but to get more practical if we can. So practical ideas, tips, techniques. And I'll put this question into the chat so you all got that. Two questions. Practically, if we can, how do you do this? And while we're waiting, I'm going to give you a link to a blog with uh, some practical suggestions in here. Because one of the biggest um, challenges that people uh, suggest to me is uh, great, Mark, but I just don't have time. And so uh, this is. Uh, this is uh, this is basically the I guess the reading uh, if you want uh, for today's uh, session at least my part of the session, and uh, and I suggest that uh, it's about uh, depth more than breadth. Uh, I want to build deep and lasting relationships with a small number of people that uh, that can be in my networks on a week to week basis. I know where they're at. Uh, I know what challenges they're facing. Uh, they know what challenges I'm facing. We share, we help each other. And by the end of this, we actually become friends. They move on to new jobs and uh, a decade later, we're still in touch. Uh, that, that's what I'm talking about here. <laughs> and for me, there's uh, four or five people that I can do that with on a, on a week to week basis and, and remain in proactive relationship. Uh, and we're going to look at a technique that might help you to be able to hone and strategically decide who you might want to invest uh, in that kind of uh, relationship with. Um, so the practical tools coming for that in the moment. But thanks, uh, Bobby. The best connection I got from a recent conference was when I saw someone struggling to carry three coffees and I offered to carry one over. I had a robust conversation and going to kick off a major project as a result. Uh, being approachable in networking situations, asking lots of questions, taking notes, uh, doing a robust follow-up message uh, when pra practicable. Uh, very good. Um, uh, I quite often like uh, to uh, to connect with people uh, on LinkedIn or, or Twitter or the social media platform of choice. Um, and there we are. I'm leaving just now. Uh, but before I go, I'm putting that request through and instantly there's that follow up. And I go away and that night the, re the request has come through. I'm able to follow up and uh, I remember who that person was. Or I take a card, I return on the back. What is that action? What is that follow up? And I make a point of following up. Uh, WhatsApp is used by many of my collaborators, says uh, Flavi in uh, Western Africa. I occasionally just drop a text to see how they are, uh, or when the football national teams had a game, uh, or on Independence or National Day. Put these things in, in your diary. Uh, and you know what? It really makes uh, a difference, uh, that little personal touch. Um, uh, Flavi also always thinking, how can this? Oh, no, that was from the previous point. Uh, great, but thank you, Flavi. Other practical ideas? Tips, techniques, what do you do to keep these relationships for the long term to build on success, to deepen and broaden? Well, I'm going to move on, but other ideas, keep them coming in the chat and we're going to come back to this and do uh, some much more practical planning for your own research uh, before the end of the hour. But uh, for now, a little bit of theory behind this, and you'll see in the blog that I've linked in the chat, this idea uh, of ideas bridging and network bridging. So what we're doing in the first case, uh, for me in the first instance, uh, is trying to connect different ideas. And this is where this idea of curiosity first comes. Uh, what is it that I can learn from this person? And they might be working in a radically different uh, different field, but I'm trying to find some point of connection now back to what I do at that point of curiosity, now leading to uh, to empathic connection. And now I'm seeing those connections. Oh, yeah, we do something similar and we call it this. And yeah, I did something in a project recently in a completely different context, but this is how it works. And it seems to be quite different. I wonder why that is. Right. 
And what history tells us is that very often this is when the biggest new insights academically come, but also very often where there are new opportunities for impact. Huh, uh, that's working in our field. I wonder, could it work in this new context as well? And as we begin to bring these ideas together, we can start to bring people uh, and networks together around those ideas. And so um, uh, as uh, he was at uh, Bobby said, uh, yeah, a great ideas came together in that conversation. And as a result of that, now we are gathering people around the ideas for a project or a paper uh, or just some kind of impact based initiative. But the first point is that meeting of minds. And now, great, we can start bringing networks together and, and connecting. Uh, but I would argue that this is still an empathic work. This is about connecting uh, with people now across these networks deeply enough that we can see the world through their eyes. And so this is, uh, as someone already said, about active listening, deep listening. It's about dialogue and it's about learning or open mindedness, as one of you suggested. Thanks for the additional ideas on the chat, Louisa. Uh, it's about making time to connect with them regularly. So um, uh, Flavi talked about uh, doing that around uh, Independence Days, National Days, football um, games. Uh, maybe it's just a, a monthly check-in, uh, just to, to ping them a message on uh, your favourite uh, app uh, or an email, uh, how are things getting on? Um, uh, that thing we were talking about, did it work? Uh, is there anything more I can do to help? Uh, and just regularly uh, touching base. Um, one way of doing that, Kate suggested, just sending people articles uh, and interesting research uh, that I think is of interest. Yeah, I'm doing that to my PhD students or to my research group or to my supervisors. Why not also send that to uh, a member of the policy community? Yeah, I was talking to you last month. I met you at this thing, just read this paper. I think you'd love it. And in fact, Kate, I did. <laughs> I literally did that with uh, with one of your papers recently to a, to a peatland policy person. <laughs> um, Helen. Uh, if there's if there's someone who works in the same location as you, make a point of taking a, a, a coffee break or a lunch with them frequently. Um, uh, Mary sharing experiences, lessons learned, uh, similar interests, fantastic. Um, uh, and uh, one final thing I'm going to suggest before we move on to uh, our task, actually, is that I think uh, an objection at this point. First objection is I don't have time. <laughs> Uh, and uh, my suggestion is uh, go deep rather than broad and make time for a small collection of people. And if you read my article, you'll see I've got uh, someone who can connect me to international policy, someone for English policy, someone for Scottish policy, someone for third sector, someone for business. And that's all I've got time to, to really stay in proactive touch with. But that's enough uh, to have really broad and deep impact. Uh, so, so focus, uh, be, be strategic. But uh, if uh, you get over the problem of time, the other problem people suggest is, well, yeah, but what if I'm just not very much of an extrovert? <laughs> and uh, and this is this is my problem. So I, I've shared quite openly on my podcast and on social media that I, I struggle with anxiety. Um, uh, I haven't made it back to face to face since um, since the, since the lockdowns, um, uh, and uh, and it's caused uh, some really big problems for me. Uh, I, I sometimes get um, panic attacks, sadly, in front of large groups of people. That's uh, my most uh, frequent uh, uh, scenario. Um, and as an academic, that's a problem. Um, so so I get it, I, I, and and I, if I'm perfectly honest, I hate conferences. Uh, it's just uh, my anxiety kicks in, imposter syndrome, whatever it is. I'm sure there's plenty of you that will relate to, relate to, to this. Um, uh, and yeah, even talking about it, I started stuttering. Can you you can hear me? <laughs> oh dear, uh, it, it it stresses me out. Uh, and uh, and my message is that you don't have to be an extrovert. You don't have to be someone who loves networking. You can be someone like me who hates networking, <laughs> uh, but uh, who decides uh, to go deep and narrow and to build those proactive relationships. And actually, um, uh, if uh, you're like me, uh, 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 the result of this is it can be very isolating. Those relationships can be really important uh, just in terms of maintaining uh, decent levels of mental health. Uh, so this, uh, yeah, maybe makes things easier in certain circumstances if you're a bit of an extrovert. Um, but the, I'm going to suggest that the techniques we're thinking about today can be for us all.
So we're going to do um, uh, an exercise. There's three elements to this. One of them is going to be an element for you to do in your own time. And uh, we're going to do one as an individual task and then one back in our groups before the uh, before the hour, thinking very practically and personally about our own research. So in the chat, I'm going to uh, share a document. And... Uh, I'm going to share an editable link, so sorry, a link to this document as well, uh, just to make sure that you can all access this. Um, so here we are. And no, that's not going to work, so I'll show you a Dropbox link. So if you click on the link, in fact, I'll just do this just now so you can see this. You will be able to, you have to download it before it becomes editable. And you can see now, here's the task. Second task is your homework. And uh, I once I've downloaded this, these text boxes are both editable and movable. So um, to just put my questions back up on the screen, I'm going to give you five minutes to do this as an individual. Uh, start within your institution, then move out to your professional networks, and then to these broader external partners, publics, other relevant groups, making sure not to forget the people that everyone always forgets. And we're asking here who we interact with to generate impact. If the answer is nobody, then that last bullet point uh, suggests, uh, well, let's uh, do about, do this in uh, in kind of prospective mode. Uh, who do I think I could in future interact with? The result is going to be an impact map, and we're going to then use this map for a couple of additional tasks. So within my institution, I might interact uh, with a mentor uh, who helps me around impact. It could be that there are other academics who have connections into organizations that I would like to be connected into. It could be there's someone from professional services um, who offers training or who can give me access to funding to help my impact. Who are those people uh, or groups? Put them on the map and put them on that in, in that inner circle. Next, moving out to your professional networks. Uh, this could be uh, disciplinary networks. If you're a researcher, uh, it could be a professional body, for example. It could be a, a network or a conference, uh, but crucially one that enables you to connect with people who can use your work and who can benefit from it. And then finally, these external partners, publics, other relevant parties, organizations out there who uh, you work with, who you think uh, can or might be able to benefit from your work. Um, there we go. So let's share my screen again. Um, what this enables you to do now is to start thinking strategically about your networks. Uh, there are countless books on you know, practical little tips and tricks, and we've covered some of that stuff. But for me, uh, when you want to really deeply affect change, uh, lasting change, this is about relationships. It's about trust. Uh, and ultimately, I'm going to use this concept of social capital. Uh, and for me, there is uh, two elements to this. Uh, there's a breadth and a depth component. And so have a think about the breadth. Uh, perhaps well, as you look at those external networks, you realize, oh, actually, yeah, they're all uh, people from the policy community. Uh, but uh, what about the third sector? Uh, working on peatlands, there's a whole load of organizations that I probably should be aware of. Maybe I need to go and do some thinking. Um, I'm not connected to, to industry, to business at all. Uh, maybe that's on purpose. Uh, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's an accident. And maybe there are people that I should be connecting from that sphere. So are there particular biases uh, that you uh, that you need to work on uh, within any of those concentric circles? Um, equally, uh, is there a bias towards one of those concentric circles? And for many academics, um, it is a bias towards the inner two rings. And I realize, yeah, I, I spend time taking colleagues for coffee. I invest in my disciplinary networks and those kinds of conferences. But when was the last time I went for a coffee with someone who was not an academic, who might be able to use my work? 
have I ever really invested in relationships with people beyond the academy in the same way that I do with my academic colleagues, or if I'm not an academic, uh, my colleagues within my institution, uh, whatever institution you work for. And most of us uh, realize, hmm, no, <laughs> I don't. And is that something you could do to, to build uh, the depth of relationship uh, with, uh, with, uh, with people like that, uh, as well as to plug some of those gaps? So remember, social capital is about breadth and depth. So let's correct any major biases uh, and think strategically if there might if there might be some organisations I need to reach out to. Uh, go look into those inner circle rings where you've got connections and ask yourself, is there someone here who could connect me into the organisations, the sectors I want to go to? Uh, and remember that uh, that this now will get you trust uh, by proxy if you get introduced by someone who is already trusted you will then have to earn your own trust and, and that is the the longer deeper task so hopefully already as you're looking at your work there are some insights emerging for you and i'd encourage you to capture those uh, make a little note maybe there's an action and you can discuss that with your colleague in the breakout room in a moment but otherwise uh, this is homework um, and it's quite useful sometimes uh, to do this as a research group do this uh, do this with a team of people and see what you discover about you as a group and uh, what you might want to do strategically what we're going to do though uh, last of all today uh, is to narrow down and prioritize some strategic relationships that we might be able to invest in more and um, this is drawing on some techniques that are known as stakeholder analysis. Uh, if you're interested in co-authoring a opinion piece paper with me, uh, I'm uh, writing an open authorship paper at the moment. Just email me if you uh, want to co-author that. Uh, I'm looking for a dead, uh, deadline for contributions is 9th of June. So uh, there are lots of interesting alternatives. Otherwise, look on my blog or listen to my podcast. <clears throat> And in this particular case, we're using a, a stakeholder analysis tool, which uh, I simply call the three eyes approach. And so I'm going to give you a couple of minutes of quiet working time now to prepare for your breakout room. So I'll share you the breakout room uh, question in a moment as well, so you know what's coming up. Uh, and uh, essentially what I'm asking you to do is to choose at least one person uh, starting in that uh, in that outside ring, so uh, one person, one organisation, uh, uh, and if you haven't got anything in the outside ring, just uh, as far uh, to the outside as possible, choose that uh, person or organisation, and then ask these questions about them. How interested are they in what I do? Uh, what aspects of what I do might they be interested in? How does this intersect with their interests? In fact, which part of the organization is likely to be most interested? Am I even talking to the right people in this organization at the moment? Maybe there are others. See what questions, actions, ideas fall out of that question. And in fact, you can do this now as I'm talking. Make a start. Uh, with that same organization, then ask yourself, how much influence does that person, does that organization have either to facilitate or to block impact from my research. So uh, what kind of, uh, of benefits would you ideally love to happen from your work one day? Uh, perhaps this is an organization that is ideologically opposed to uh, say my work on ecosystem markets and peaked and carbon markets. Huh. I need to know who they are, why they are opposed. I need to reach out and understand if there's a way to overcome their objections. Uh, maybe just stop working in this area if it turns out they're right. <laughs> Find a win-win. Who knows? Uh, perhaps this is an organization that actually has the, the power, the funding, the people, the staff time to help make these ideas reality. Uh, which part of the organization should I work with? Why do they have influence? With whom do they have influence, for example? see what falls out of that. And then uh, that's often quite indirect. So I wonder how might they, by, they be directly impacted, either positively or negatively, by my work. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm working with a policy organisation and uh, there's a bunch of policy organisations that have targets now around private investment in nature-based solutions. 
Uh, and uh, ultimately, the beneficiaries of that uh, is its nature. It's maybe local communities uh, around uh, those uh, the, those projects. But uh, but I wonder, are there some 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 short term political gains uh, for those people? Well, it's a manifesto pledge. Uh, there's a target that needs to be met uh, that they're going to be judged on. Uh, perhaps this research can help them directly as well. And might that get people even more excited about working with me um, and uh, and at least picking up the phone or coming on a, on a call with me to uh, to find out more. So a couple of minutes to just reflect on these questions. Um, and yeah, I said I'd show you what comes next. So our paired task then is to reflect on our answers to these questions and choose one person that you would like to start adding value to and then to discuss with your partner why and how. So you can make some very practical initial starting steps. And uh, for many of us, that starting um, start, that very first initial step is an email saying, can we talk? Your answers to these questions is what's going to enable you to write an email that will get us a yes. Because yes, I'm interested in that. Uh, and yes, that's exactly what we're trying to achieve. And I can see exactly how we and the people we're working with will benefit. If you can help us with this, then I'm all ears. Yes, let's talk. And that's a very different response to the kind of response you get when it's just, here's me, here's my research, can we talk? Hmm. Uh, not relevant enough, I'm too busy, delete. So anyway, I'm talking two minutes to have a reflect on these individually in preparation for our final breakout room discussion. And I've been asking everyone to reflect on these questions so that we can take a targeted, strategic approach to how we build deep, meaningful, lasting networks that can achieve real impact. So at this point, <clears throat> you should have uh, have reflected uh, uh, on at least one of these people or organizations in your impact map. Uh, and it may well be that person that you decide to talk about in your pair. But of course, you can choose anyone. Uh, perhaps uh, you're now working through some of those uh, questions, my three eyes, in your partner, uh, in your pair, uh, as you think about why it is that this is someone that I should really prioritize uh, a relationship with. And how, how are you going to do this uh, practically? Uh, and, uh, and hopefully you can help each other with this. Um, uh, I'm just gonna ask uh, Jane, if you are uh, here, could you do a recreate on the groups because we've got some new people and see if you can get this uh, sorted out for? Uh, yeah, we'll do. How long be... are they in for? Um, uh, probably 10 minutes uh, is what we're going to uh, aim for here. Uh, so as you're setting that up, I'm going to give you a worked example. We'll be hearing from Maria and Franziska uh, in a moment. Um, and uh, if you read my blog, you'll see how I've identified five people that I stay in regular communication with to try and add value to. Uh, and one of those uh, is Diana Kapansky, who is the director of the Global Peatlands Initiative uh, that uh, is backing this work and who I co-chair the research working group with. Uh, and uh, I realized once GPI had started, this is an organization that has very similar interests to mine. I wonder if I could help. And uh, and so I contacted Diana and I said, um, here I am. Uh, but again, it was an empathic mode. I tried to find out as much as I could about what GPI was doing. Uh, I started drafting a policy brief based on all the stuff I knew that could be of relevance. Uh, based on that, I reached out and I said, here are a few things that I think might be helpful. Could I come and talk to you? Uh, and I'm willing to come all the way to Nairobi if that's what it takes. But um, she was going to be in Europe uh, at a climate conference. And so she was like, yep, I'll meet you in Poland. Uh, and so I met her in Poland um, uh, and we established, huh, we do have quite similar interests. Um, and my uh, approach then was just to offer myself uh, with my services as much as I could for free uh, to, to try and help as much as I could. And I've consistently maintained that attitude of, well, here is someone who is doing incredible things that could have incredible global impact. And let's just keep asking, how can I help? <laughs> uh, and uh, and hence the 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 the, uh, the research working group was born. 
Uh, hence, uh, this uh, training programme was born. Um, uh, hence, uh, we've got a new uh, initiative uh, around evidence synthesis um, uh, that, uh, that I've pitched, just trying to constantly look for ways to add value. Um, uh, and um, uh, and great. Uh, ultimately, uh, this might have started off quite strategic. I'd never met Diana until that point. And now uh, I count Diana as a friend. Uh, we both have daughters um, of a similar age uh, going through school. They went through lockdown together. Uh, and uh, and for me, uh, Diana is far more than just a colleague, and that is how this, in theory, should work. This is uh, not just about being strategic. It's not Machiavell Machiavellian in any way. This is about uh, a, a form of networking that is friendship-based. It's deep and it's lasting. Uh, we're going to wrap up at this stage, and I'm going to hand over to uh, to Maria and uh, Francisca. Uh, Francisca first, in fact. Um, in just a moment. But my hope is that uh, you are at a point now where there's some structure to your thinking about your networks. Uh, and within that structure, there's some strategy. Uh, and within that strategy now, there's a sense of here at least is one person from one organization that I can reach out to. Uh, and there's a sense of how and why you will be able to reach out to them now. And so your action, of course, is uh, to make contact, uh, to think deeply about that initial uh, that initial contact, so that this is about them, is about that initial empathic connection based on their interests as much as yours. So you can have that initial meeting, uh, or uh, re-engage you know, in, in an existing uh, organisation in these new issues uh, where you can see that that uh, intersection of interests so that you can start to do that curiosity and empathy building, ideas bridging to network bridging to, yeah, now here's something that could really help. Um, to conclude, I, I want to just to reflect on what I hope is a valuable and quite different way of thinking about networks. Uh, if you've followed any of my work, you'll know that uh, uh, empathy is something that's, uh, that threads through what I do. Uh, and uh, traditional approaches to networking are all about the techniques, the tips, the tricks, um, and uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. And we'll probably hear a few of those ideas as well from Francisca and Maria. Uh, but I wanted to give you a, a, a theoretical framework uh, and some concepts that could help you to think much more strategically, because for me, it's about that depth of relationship um, and that social capital that is ultimately what's going to enable you to build relationships with people who can benefit from your research and can use your research to benefit others. So it is three o'clock and it is time as a couple of people need to drop off at this point. Um, but for those of us who are left, I'm going to hand over to uh, Francisca to start with. Uh, if you could start by introducing yourself, if that's OK, Francisca, and, uh, and then we're going to hear from Maria after uh, two perspectives. Uh, on two very successful networkers who have networked in the peatland space and through those networks have achieved impressive impact. So fascinated. I'm looking forward to hearing what you've both got to say. Francisca. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, um, I will show very briefly a few slides about my work. I'm uh, one of the two directors of the Greifswald Meyer Center here in Northeast Germany. Mm -hmm. I'm personally focusing on fence, and I will indeed talk a bit more about peatlands now because I think that, that was very nice as a generic uh, background. Um, but uh, I, I guess what unites us all uh, is our love and our interest in peatlands. Um, so I will just start with my first slide and. Um, just very briefly, um, so the Greifswald Meyer Center is actually a collaboration itself. We have uh, three partners in it. It's the university, Greifswald University. We have the only German uh, chair of peatland sciences. We have lots of um, yeah, infrastructure for studying peatlands, um, field sites, of course. We have a foundation, uh, Michael Zucco Foundation, and they own 1,000 hectares of own peatland. They do a lot of active management. Um, but also peatland uh, restoration and paludiculture projects in uh, more than 10 countries. So it's uh, the focus on implementation, of course. And we have an uh, additional NGO, um, like the, the fast track, um, fast boat um, for advice, for policy briefs, for side events, for lots of types of works uh, the other partners cannot do um, uh, in the same way. And you will notice on the uh, 
bottom of my slide, there are these boxes in different colors. Uh, these are databases we maintain. And um, I will um, tell a bit more about databases in a minute. Um, just a view on this network of people. I mean, we are talking about our own networks, but usually our direct work environment is also a network. And I think we can also practice um, empathy and how we deal with people, how we build relationships a lot in our direct uh, work environment. Um, one of the things that um, characterizes our work, I think, and that I also personally consider as very useful is to, to have a broad geographic scope. I mean, we, we feel responsible for the peatlands directly. When I look out of the window here, we have lots of drained peatland outside Greifswald. Actually, the university itself owns peatland that is still drained. So we are working with our university um, lead um, on, on revetting peatlands owned by university, but then we have really a global orientation uh, with respect to the collection and integration of data um, and uh, the, the development of concepts and um, methodologies. And this is just a brief view on, on countries where we are engaged in peatland research and conservation. What we also do a lot is to build databases. And this is something I think that nicely brings people together because it, it values a lot the, the uh, input uh, from every single contributor to a database. One of our databases is um, the Global Peatland Database, where we collect GIS data sets, but also books, for example, um, any kind of, um, of uh, record of, of peat, peatland occurrence, the occurrence of organic soils uh, somewhere around the world, and that we use for um, interesting products from it. And um, one of the products, for example, was uh, the Peatland Map of Europe um, that we published in 2017. And this was like a multi, multi, multi author uh, paper with lots of people uh, actually from every single European country, there was at least one co author. And this was a very nice way of engaging everybody from the different countries. It's a bottom up map where so we merged all the national data sets, we harmonized the national data sets. And um, from this network. I think what also united us was doing something nice. So, so doing a map together, for example, is basically something nice and you have a nice product from it. Um, other nice things you can do with other people and researchers is nice uh, meta analyses. So this is, for example, an analysis of data sets uh, stretching from, from the UK to, to the east of Belarus. Um, you see that uh, the, the, the circles on the map and we actually used the, the COVID-19 pandemic to ask lots of people to share data sets because everybody was sitting at home. We had some time at home. And then um, we analyzed them to what extent the revetted fans um, resemble or um, are different from the near natural or the natural fans. So that was a nice exercise basically to do with a big group of people. And um, touching a bit on, on policy, so we are also involved in, 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 in peatland policies. That was just one example uh, in last June. We brought together really um, a wide range of different organizations in an open letter on peatlands with regard to the European Union restoration law. And we send it to, to the commission, to the president and to the vice president. Um, and we also got feedback from there. So it was at that time useful. And uh, we just, my colleagues today, sent out um, an invite um, to researchers about another um, yeah, position paper or open letter related to the nature restoration law, actually about the afforestation of plants, because there's a strong lobbying at the moment in Brussels um, to afforest uh, drain peatlands better than to revet them, which is, of course, wrong. <laughs> we should revet them better than to afforest them. Um, so um, these are just occasions that we also spot because we are closely connected to NGOs, to, to people sitting directly in Brussels, and then we, we use our networks to, um, to come up with uh, the latest scientific evidence for specific questions that are relevant. And then, of course, using other networks, um, Mark mentioned the Global Peatlands Initiative, which also brought Mark and me, for example. No, we, I think we met before already. It was about more futures and peatland code. Uh, but then later, we, we also collaborate now under the framework of this Global Peatlands Initiative. And um, this initiative, for example, was also kind of background for um, a very nice network working on the Global Peatlands Assessment um, that was published then uh, last year about the state of peatlands worldwide. And just to finish up, last but not least, um, um, that was lots of content related slides, uh, a bit about the relationships, which I also value very much. Um, it's always um, about people. And this is just 
Um, yeah, slightly minding myself that I had a nice uh, evening on Saturday. Um, we had Niels Landgren from uh, Sweden, a very nice jazz um, playing the trombone, a very nice jazz uh, musician um, on my island here in Northeast Germany. And there were lots of politicians as well, also from our more right wing party. And I was sitting there together with um, the founder of Writers for Future on my island. And um, I used the occasion to bring them together. Um, and I think it's always very useful to have a consistent position and also attitude towards such topics, but at the same time to um, leave also some space and time for discussing other topics. And basically on that evening, we discussed about music, about playing the trombone, about playing different instruments in a big band. But I'm, I'm very sure that, that the, these two people have now a better basis for continuing their discussion uh, and I'm sure next time they will talk about climate protection and I think it's um, it's very useful also to um, and as Mark said already also to spend time with other people outside your professional networks and to to leave really some space for other topics and um, and positions of course as well that's it I'm happy to answer any questions and I think for now over to Maria Great, thank you, Francisco. That was fascinating. Um, and yeah, I've kind of been on the margins watching uh, what you've been doing with GMC, with uh, yeah, just being totally inspired by what you guys achieve. It is it has been incredible for many, many years. Maria, uh, great. We have an introduction, uh, an introductory slide. So over to you if you want to introduce yourself, and uh, and then we've got time for Q and A afterwards. So Maria, thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks. And that's what sort of Francisca and I are hoping that we'll have lots of times to just sort of have a discussion and answer questions. And so, jumping right off from from how we ended, I do think it's a lot about relationship building and about people. So just a bit about me. Um, I am a professor and a research chair in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management at the University of Waterloo, which is in Canada. We're about an hour west of Toronto, which most people can picture if you're not uh, if you're not from Canada. Um, and so my research really focuses on carbon storage and greenhouse gas exchange in peatlands. And I started by thinking about the impacts of climate change, but more and more I'm working on disturbance and restoration. And that in itself really involves, like it necessitates a need to network with industry partners because we're working on lands where they're managing the land, um, but also with government to develop the policies that are then gonna take our learnings forward and put them into, into practice and regulations. And so I'll talk a little bit, um, just for a few minutes on sort of some of those networks that I've built, um, how, you know, a lot of what I think Mark has already introduced about listening being really important, um, but also that then this really can open up opportunities for impact. And so through a lot of these relationships that I've built, you know, one of the things that it's allowed me to do is uh, over the last few years been a member of Canada's nature-based climate solutions advisory committee. So now being actually able to talk to those that are putting these policies in place, taking the, the knowledge that we know, but also the perspectives that I've gained from a lot of these other partners, like those that are in industry or in Indigenous communities. So um, I had a great discussion actually in one of the breakout rooms with Marta about how the, re the relationships you build and the interactions you have can be really place specific and context dependent. And so I do also think that when you have the opportunities, at least in the peatland space, that you have very different connections and relationships with people when you can actually get on the land with them. Um, and so here are just some of the photos of some of the types of disturbances that I work on from horticultural peat extraction and how do we restore those sites to seismic lines and well pads and the other two photos there that are both oil and gas industrial disturbances. Um, and we try as much as we can to meet with those people that are working on the land, that are using the land, um, on the ground when we can to actually build those relationships and then sort of get those different perspectives. Um, and as Mark introduced to in, sort of our goal or why one of the things, one of the ways that I define our impact is actually improving those management practices on the land, right? So there's policy, but a lot of times we also need to be working with practitioners directly that have these actual environmental constraints in order to apply the restoration on the ground. So that's how one of the ways that I judge my impact. 
uh, along with writing papers is like, how do we actually change that practice? And like we talked a lot about today, we need to talk, we need to share what we know, but we really need to listen. And that does take time. As much as we say we don't have time, um, it does take time because you're relationship building and you need to have those regular continued discussions. And I think, Mark, you gave some really good examples of, of highlighting where you have things in common, but I think it's also important to be really open to being challenged back. So that's one of the things that I really like working with practitioners is that we have our own perspectives of how we think things are, and then we hear their challenges about, oh, we could never do that, it's too expensive, or we can't actually bring that piece of equipment onto the land at that time of the year. Um, and maybe we can solve that problem together, but if we didn't have that conversation, we wouldn't really understand their constraints, their specific needs, and the challenges that they face. And I think it we should be open also to being wrong, right? So that like, actually, we think it should be this way, but your challenges made us think about it more deeply, made us go back out and change the research questions that we were asking, and maybe we're wrong. Um, and that was that was a great outcome as well, that we were able to learn that through that discussion. Um, and so the I think also just taking that opportunity to sometimes reach out to someone, as Mark suggested, we also several years ago, um, had an opportunity for a keynote speaker at an event we were hosting. And I said, why don't we invite Diana Kapansky? Um, I, I've heard about this global peatland initiative. It was a World Wetlands Day event and Diana is actually Canadian. So I said, here's a great opportunity and a connection where she'll probably agree to come back. Um, and through that, um, the Water Institute at University of Waterloo became one of the partners, the first university partner um, from Canada of the Global Peatlands Initiative. And then over the pandemic, we were able to host a series of seminars on um, Canadian peatland management. And through that, we started to really um, hear how much interest there was in peatlands in Canada, both locally, but also internationally, and um, also see some of the challenges of a lot of different groups trying to work in this space and maybe duplicating efforts, not necessarily knowing all the information and the research that was there. Um, and so through some of those connections and the wide range of stakeholders here, so in just in this photo from, from a Zoom slide here, there's people, there's academics, but there's also federal government uh, officials, there's people from NGOs, there's Diana uh, from the Global Peatlands Initiative. And this has now led to a project that we just started this fall called CanPete, where we're able to bring together um, all these different perspectives to advance peatland management in Canada. Um, we're happy, to, I'm always happy to talk more about that and you can always shoot me an email if that's something you wanna hear more about. We just started this fall, so sort of expect to hear more from us over the next five years. So I'm just happy to sort of have a discussion about sort of how we've built those networks and, and some of the challenges and, um, challenges and I guess advantages or it, you know, things, the impact that you can have. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, is, yeah. Again, the breadth of things that you're doing, I think is incredibly impressive. Um, uh, also your cap, I want one of your peat caps, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, and again, Diana Kapansky, all three of us uh, mentioning that one key person who is uh, is networked and can open doors. Um, uh, and yeah, who is that for you? Um, and hopefully, the, the Diana isn't now going to be deluged by people getting in touch saying, "Do you fancy a virtual coffee?" <laughs> but uh, uh, but but yeah, I, and I love this idea of of of, of, of broadening these networks. Uh, so you can be challenged and to, to, to recognize that you may be wrong and to invite that um, and, and and just the curiosity that, uh, and, the, and the crazy, wonderful new places it takes you to. So Maria, Franziska, thank you. We have time until half past now for questions and discussion. So over to you. Who would like to ask a question, perhaps share an insight of your own, some of your own experiences? That can be to any of the three of us, or just to the whole group, if it's a, a reflection. Over to you. Raise hand is under the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen, or you can uh, write your comment if you prefer. Thanks, Helen. Over to you. Hey, thanks. That was really cool. Um, 
so it was just a, something that I was talking to a friend about the other day. So they've got a conference coming up and they're genuinely quite worried about the networking part because they know that what they're doing is quite like high profile, but they're also, you know, a PhD student. They've got no kind of influence and they're scared about in networking sessions, actually just having their ideas stolen and how they actually go about having those conversations with like, high-end researchers in a way that they can talk about what they do and develop those connections, but without risking actually someone going, or oh, if I just publish that first, that's under my name then. And that's so, I don't know if that's something that we should be worried about or, yeah. Okay, interesting. So uh, I'm going to ask Maria or Francisca to answer that, if that's okay, because it's not something that I tend to worry about. But maybe you do. Maybe you've got um, uh, techniques for dealing with that. So would either of you be able to answer that? I yeah, I don't know. I can take a first stab at it, and you would you would hope it's not a guarantee, right? But that there there is some ethics in other academics that they wouldn't do that. I would also say, I don't know if, if there's an opportunity or if this if the person is traveling with others from their group, but to sort of have a champion with you, right? So like if I'm with my students, I'm introducing them to help them be, build their professional networks, but I'm you know sure to, to kind of mention their name multiple times and the incredible work that they are doing so that the more people that that champion mentions that student's name and their work with, it, it helps to, to really solidify it with that person and it sort of reduces the risk that someone else could could take it with. It, you can never eliminate that, but maybe those two things together, the, the confidence that there are ethical principles in others and that your name can be associated with that work, um, you know, with the help of a champion who might be a little bit more senior can, can kind of help to allay some of those fears. Yeah, nice. Um, Francisca, you're welcome to build on that. The, the other question for, for you and Maria um, is, uh, would you describe yourself as an uh, introvert or an extrovert? Uh, and based on your answer, uh, any uh, any stories or, or tips uh, on networking from either introvert or extrovert kind of perspectives? Yeah, probably I'm a bit more extrovert than introvert. Uh, it helps you, of course, when when you are building relationships, when when you're, um, I mean, approaching other people. So I, I more and more often I'm I'm also representing the guys at Meyer Center now in, in in different networks and different occasions. So I, I'm I'm stepping just into big rooms with lots of people I have never met before and who are potentially very important. Um, so um, yeah, it, I, I do not always feel very comfortable with it, but but I think that's something you can also learn. I mean, how to to um, to connect first to to a few people and then to move on in, in, in such a group. And um, I'm also um, yeah more or less giving now a lot of um, like I have a lot of media contacts now, giving a lot of interviews. Um, I recently um, actually appeared this month, um, published a book together with a journalist about peatlands. Um, that's like the the uh, kind of first major um, um, war. Yeah, um, it's not not a scientific book. It, it's more a personal book. And um, by doing so, I also learned a lot that you can and should distinguish between personal information and private information. So I'm not sharing lots of private information, or maybe not at all. But I'm sharing personal information, and I think this is also something that is important to to learn. Mm, yeah, fascinating. Um. Uh, uh, on a, yeah, uh, so I wonder, Maria, I don't know if you want to also answer that question and share any stories, um, uh, or uh, also Marta's asking about um, dealing with failure or trouble uh, in uh, in existing networks. I'm not sure if you have any stories of, or if you can think about how you dealt with that and perhaps generalize a bit, Maria. Yeah, I mean, I'd say I'm definitely introvert. Uh, introverted. I'm actually a very shy person, which my students now think is is quite funny. But uh, I find sometimes building those deep relationships can actually be helpful as an introvert because you now have a few key people that you, you know, if you're at a meeting, like I find, I don't mind a conference that much, but like I find being in a room of people I don't know very intimidating. I, I'm not the type that would go and just introduce myself. So having a few key people that you do have relationships can, can sometimes help that in that they're able to facilitate some of those introductions in those larger social settings. Um, 
in uh, terms of challenges will, um, yeah. tip if we can chip, chip in and uh, and maybe either of you can think about the the, the question around failure trouble in, in existing networks um it is just simply to to look around the room for someone else who looks as awkward as you someone else who is uh, sitting there staring at their coffee trying not to look at anyone because they feel kind of a, a bit of a fish out of water and to go and talk to them um uh, and um and now instantly you've got common ground because you're both feeling just as awkward as each other <laughs> um uh, and um and then yeah it's completely random in terms of who they might be uh, not strategic in any way but what a great challenge in terms of being curious and finding empathic connection with whoever this random person is um so maria uh, back to you or or francisca on um on dealing with uh, with with failure or trouble in existing networks um what's what's your approach or I can try and answer this one. <laughs> I'm giving you all the hard ones. <laughs> Do either of you have an answer to this? Or um... You're just trying to think what kind of failure would it be? Um, a failure of making a connection to somebody or what, what kind of failure do you have in mind? Uh, so Marta might want to, to share, I think a fairly common one increasingly now is uh, we didn't get the funding. Uh, we created false expectations uh, or we said uh, we were going to do something in a research mm -hmm. project. The research didn't quite work out how we expected and we had to pivot. We didn't uh, deliver the thing that uh, that we'd expected to at the end. So uh, under delivery, I think, is, is probably the most common challenge, at least that I experience. Um, yeah, to develop alternative um, ideas for funding, for what whatever it is in we are in need of and then to to move on and to really um, address it also directly so we had this occasion last year we we have now like 10 year large scale paludiculture projects in, in Germany and um, we had two consortia here in our region and we knew that only one would be selected and one uh, of them was here in Greifswald with the university with the city of Greifswald with, with lots of people around we meet every day basically and this application was turned down and then we immediately also met uh, and and we forwarded it now to different other potential funding sources. Um, I think th this is very important to to um, keep in touch and to to look out for new opportunities. And I think empathy really comes into play here as well. I mean, if if you have those connections, I think your your partners will will recognize that you know fun if it's a funding failure like that. Things, things don't always work out and, and everyone put a lot of time into that and they'll actually sort of feel empathetic for you. And I think the same goes, you know, in my experience with um, industry partners who are often like, they might be managing a landscape that we're working in. And that I can think of a couple of examples where something has had to change that they've, they've made a decision, for example, to like put up a peat dam somewhere where we hadn't discussed or to re-disturb an area that, that was restored because they have different priorities and different challenges that they're that they're facing that are not always just the research that we're doing. So is that disappointing to us when that happens? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you need to op talk openly about sort of that that caused some hardship for me, those decisions you made. But I also have to have some empathy to realize that they made that decision because, you know, they have 100 employees that have to keep working over here and that they are also trying to balance those challenges. So. Um, with that empathy, I think we can continue to move forward with our relationship, um, make sure that sort of they understand that that didn't make me particularly happy, but it wasn't enough to sort of end this relationship that I have. And I sort of value the other benefits that we're getting from this, this relationship. Um, fantastic. Yeah, and a really nice connection back to, to what we were discussing earlier. Um, I'll give you an example of personal conflict in, in a, a peatland network as it happens. Um, uh, I was coming up with a research proposal, uh, discussed it with someone that I met at a conference and um, said, yeah, what do you think? Um, would you be interested in helping? Uh, eventually, I decided, yeah, there's not enough funding for everyone. I'm going to have to cut various bits out. And so I didn't then pursue this with this person. Um, but then communicated it really, really badly. I'd made the decision. Uh, they found out kind of through the back door that I'm going ahead with this project, but I'm not now going to work with them. And they were really upset. Um, uh, and I assume this is what caused them to do this, but they then um, started uh, to, to, to spread rumours about me that uh, that I regularly um, will run off with other people's ideas. Uh, and uh, and they, they said uh, that apparently this is well known about me and they've been warned off ever working with me because yeah, I, I steal people's ideas. And I was like, what? 
and because I'm now paranoid, I'm going through every paper. Have I inadvertently published something where yeah, someone maybe told me something and, and I could fool with paranoia? And my initial initial reaction was to put something out on social media to say, look, if you ever think, if you've ever thought this about me, please tell me. I want to know what this is so I can sort this out. Uh, but actually, uh, I my, my first reaction was to go to the person, try to get them to talk to me. Multiple failed attempts. They wouldn't talk to me. Um, and so I went to key people on my network to say, have you ever heard this? Is this true? Um, uh, and uh, and nobody had heard this. It turns out this was just something they were saying in anger. And I also then discovered this person has a bit of a temper and they say things when they get angry. Ah, OK. Uh, and so 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 just not overreacting and putting something out publicly, trying to establish empathic connection with someone and even when that failed uh, to then go back to my networks to my strong network to people who I know will be honest with me <laughs> to try and then resolve this um, and it was resolved as well as possible and uh, now I've got strategic people in my networks who if they do hear this as a rumor they can instantly say yeah I know exactly where that comes from <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, networks uh, can work incredibly powerfully. They can go wrong. Uh, and ultimately, it is about the strength of those empathic connections that enables us to hopefully uh, right wrongs when they happen. We are uh, pretty much out of time. In the chat, I have given you a link to our survey form. We would love to know what you think. Um, and um, Next session, uh, do we have this here? Um, I can't remember what it is, actually. Uh, but uh, if you go to this link, I'll put this link in the chat in a moment. You'll see what's coming up next. And uh, these are our links on Twitter, if you'd like to follow us there. But we're also on LinkedIn. Uh, we have a session on the 4th of April. Sorry. Sorry, we have a session on the 4th of April on... Um... Oh, here it is. I just had to press next. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Our next session, 4th of April, and uh, Sarah Thornton and Kristen uh, Maynard will be joining me and uh, we'll be thinking about this uh, in particular in relation to communities in developing world context. Uh, we'll be thinking about positionality and uh, more challenging issues alongside the practical issues as well. So do book and we will see you then. Otherwise, that is us coming up to half past. I'm going to hang around if there's anyone who wants some informal chat uh, over the next uh, few minutes. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your afternoon or morning or evening, wherever you are. It has been a real pleasure. <laughs>